Eh, buonasera a tutti um, uh, per questo secondo appuntamento dei Dialogues del progetto uh, Lumen, uh, progetto Riva all'interno uh, ospitati dal MAD Murate Art District. Um, io sono la curatrice Anna Caterina Piras e il mio grande piacere um, condividere con voi questo secondo appuntamento che vede um, tre eh, partecipazioni um, da tre punti molto diversi del nostro globo, del nostro pianeta e quindi senza andare troppo oltre avremo Jason Ho che eh, ci parla dalla Cina, ci presenta dalla Cina eh, le sue sperimentazioni ehm, di urbanismo informale in Cina, quindi diciamo un argomento molto particolare e soprattutto pensando al suo paese di origine. Poi avremo Mark Raimond che ci parla da Johannesburg e infine Simon Boussier che ci parla e dalle Hawaii che attualmente è ehm, da qualche parte in giro nel deserto. E la ehm, lecture è in, in inglese perché i nostri ospiti sono in inglese quindi io farò uno switch in inglese però quello che mi preme molto, quello che è molto importante per me è questo dire che finalmente noi abbiamo, eh, siamo da anni che collaboriamo col progetto Riva facciamo parte del progetto Riva come il W Circus la nostra organizzazione, abbiamo iniziato a collaborare sin dal 2017 ehm, lungo le sponde dell'Arno, uh, del, del fiume Arno, proprio perché noi abbiamo questa um, attitudine eh, condivisa alla progettazione partecipata, effimera e spontanea con la comunità locale e perché appunto il progetto Riva è da tanti anni che porta avanti una sperimentazione con artisti, con um, eh, architetti, paesaggisti, per un approccio diverso, sensibile e per alimentare il dibattito verso una, una rinascita di un parco fluviale all'interno della città di Firenze. Poi avremo la Valentina Gensini che è la curatrice, la direttrice artistica eh, del eh, Murate Art District ma anche eh, del progetto Riva che eh, ci dirà, ehm, ci saluterà e ci darà il suo benvenuto e ci, forse ci vorrà dire qualche parola in più rispetto a Riva. Ok, adesso io farò un piccolo switch eh, perché, um, sorry guys, I'm going to speak now i think that there is valentina è, ci sta raggiungendo online uh, se sì in... ah ciao vale <ride> buon pomeriggio <ride> buona serata ciao cara. Buonasera. allora io mi sono permessa di um, um, dare un cenno al progetto riva non ti vediamo ancora oh, infatti <ride> Perfetto, ciao allora io mi sono permessa appunto di situare eh, questi dialogues che abbiamo, eh, dialogues scusate, che abbiamo ehm, creato insieme, voluto insieme all'interno del progetto Riva, Lumen, eh, proprio per l'attinenza delle nostre pratiche partecipate, eh, noi del W Circus e da questa collaborazione che ci vede appunto da diversi anni insieme, sin dal 2017. E quindi ehm, è un grande piacere per noi, noi ti ringraziamo per averci ospitato con questo, diciamo, entourage internazionale ai gli antipodi del mondo perché stasera avremo appunto Jason Ho che ci presenterà il suo approccio dell'urbanismo informale in Cina, poi avremo Mark Raymond dal Sudafrica e poi finalmente Simon Boussier dalle Hawaii. E se vuoi dire due parole io puoi fare lo switch in inglese e partirei subito con la presentazione di Jason Ho con il suo bellissimo video uh, Market Museum perché abbiamo i tempi stretti come sappiamo. Sì, sì. Allora innanzitutto grazie Anna Caterina di questo incontro, eh, è un momento importante per noi perché questo è tutto il public program di Riva di quest'anno, abbiamo deciso appunto di eh, fare una commissione diciamo precisa a LW Circus nel tentativo di eh, condividere le esperienze comuni come già abbiamo fatto in quest'anno e quest'anno di focalizzarle proprio sul progetto Riva che è un progetto che ehm, pratica da anni modalità che ora leggiamo come prioritarie finalmente nel New Bauhaus quindi come prioritaria anche nell'agenda europea 
eh, per eh, definire eh, le priorità di metodo, di attenzione eh, e poi di pratiche, di buone pratiche. Eh, è infatti inutile, ne parlavamo anche oggi con una curatrice internazionale che è venuta qui ospite al MAD, eh, parlare, continuare a parlare di progetti ecologici e di arte relata al territorio, all'ambiente, all'ecologia, se poi non si attuano modalità eh, ecologiche come questa in fondo di presentazione e partecipazione. Quindi con l'avvento del bel tempo ci muoveremo anche intorno al nostro fiume, con Anna Caterina Piras abbiamo previsto visto anche due workshop e laboratori intorno al fiume con i migranti, eh, con i non udenti, quindi eh, è importante, sono progetti in cui le comunità più fragili si vanno ad aggiungere alla comunità eh, cosiddetta normodotata, questo terribile termine, perché in realtà abbiamo molto da imparare, quindi l'idea di stare insieme esercitando pratiche, facendo esperienze, è un'idea che ci appartiene, ci accomuna e ci, ci tiene stretti in questo, no? con il Perfetto. W Circus e con la vostra esperienza. Quindi ringrazio tutti i relatori, do il via ai lavori e questa attenzione che noi abbiamo sul fiume come spunto prioritario di rigenerazione urbana è una eh, attenzione molto importante, credo, perché le città col fiume ci accomunano a molte, moltissime città in tutto il mondo e i problemi del dissesto idrogeologico che, hanno, che abbiamo affrontato noi a Firenze sono problemi che interessano le comunità di tutto il mondo e quindi questa visione globale rafforza l'identità eh, locale, eh, credo, con la divisione e condivisione di buone pratiche. Quindi grazie, grazie a tutti i relatori. Thank you for being here. Perfetto, thanks so much Valentina. So now we can start. We are speaking about alternative practices in managing, managing the problem that is not a problem. It should be a pleasure for us in redesigning our contemporary cities. And I think that we couldn't start better than with the Market Museum video of uh, uh, Jason Ho that is going to be a really interesting project he has done. Uh, he's, he's, he's trying to bring the people outside of the market and make it a, a, a museum in the street, you will see it. And then we will have Jason that will present uh, his um, uh, practice. Thanks so much.
Ragazzi, allora, eh, come dicevamo, questo era il video di Jason Ho che spiegava appunto di questa um, sua pratica, di questa sperimentazione in questo, in questo museo che è um, questo market museum, quindi un mercato che è stato trasformato direttamente in un museo e quindi la cittadinanza è stata portata fuori nelle strade intorno, cittadinanza, comunità locale che lavorava nel museo che non aveva mai avuto l'opportunità di entrare in una galleria. Ora, siccome abbiamo avuto, adesso dovrebbe esserci la presentazione di Jason, e abbiamo avuto un paio di problemi di audio perché il video non si sentiva, quindi io chiederei alla regia se l'audio funziona, la presentazione di Jason potrete verificare, se no possiamo passare direttamente alla presentazione di Mark Raimond e, e, e poi tornare su Jason. Ditemi voi. Non si sente? Suggerirei di andare oltre per poi riprendere o pubblicare sì. direttamente il video contributo. Eh? Sì, 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 perché Grazie. mi dicono i ragazzi che lì funziona ma noi non sentiamo. Sì. Quindi io direi di passare la parola finché eh, la regia lì non, 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 ci non ci risolve il problema dell'audio, io direi di passare la parola direttamente a Mark. Mm. Okay, so I think uh, that uh, in somehow we could switch to Mark, waiting for... Hi. Hi, Mark. So I'm <laughs> nice I'm to see you. Yeah, nice yeah, I'm, I'm, I would too. like to present you. Mark Raimon is the director of GA, GSA School of Architecture in Johannesburg. He's uh, a well-known practitioner and uh, is from Caribbean, from uh, Trinidad de Tobago. He is going to present today to us uh, a, a lecture, um, a dialogue that is called Transformative Practice. And is um, something that is about his research, is focused and cut for us for these uh, talks, dialogues. <laughs> and uh, we cannot wait to see your presentation, Mark. Thanks so much to be with us today. Thank you. Let me <laughs> share the screen.
Okay, so can you can you see my screen? No, we are wait for it. It says it's failed. Actually, can we try again? Yes, please. Yes, it is now running. You, Thank you very you much. Now you can see it, yes? Yes, very well. Okay, yes. so thank so thank you for inviting me um, to participate. Um, you know, I've been having a continuing conversation with Anna Katarina for a few years now. And, uh, you know, our conversations uh, touch on many things. And most recently, we've been talking about this idea of transformative practices, which is something that's very important to, to me. Um, I, I was part of the RMIT practice-based PhD program in, in Barcelona, which is where Anna Katri and I first met. And um, I did my research there about my practice in Trinidad, um, which is, uh, I still have some projects there, but now I'm teaching at the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, where I'm the director. And the, one, of the, one of the important themes of the school is this idea of a transformative pedagogy. And the idea that through teaching and learning, uh, one can engender transformation. And that has a very specific meaning and value in South Africa, uh, post-apartheid, Transformation refers to the social, the economic, the political transformation of the society through addressing a range of very often complex issues that are necessary for the evolution and the transformation of the society to a more socially just and socially equitable one. And the school of the Graduate School of Architecture is very much built around this, 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 this ethos. Uh, and I've been very interested in the idea of understanding how we can move from this idea of a transformative pedagogy to transformative practices. If the pedagogy is about the teaching and the learning, then what is, what is the practice about? And I thought what I would do today is um, go through some of the thinking um, and some of the, the, the ideas that have emerged through conversation. It's a little bit of a kind of chronicle or a journalistic presentation rather than the presentation of a theory uh, it's really a set of observations um, that speak a little bit about the trajectory of my own thinking and uh, how my work and practice in Trinidad um, has developed and evolved into the work at the GSA and how the thinking that um, I've been engaging with um, Anna Katerina on, I think, folds into the work and folds into um, perhaps progressive, transformative ways of thinking about how we produce space, uh, how we contemplate, how we consider and how we conceptualize uh, space. This is a map of Trinidad from the, I think the 1960s or 70s, it's, it's part of Port of Spain. And it looks at the, um, the complexity of the, the urban form, the waterfront, and in the bottom right, the, the marshland, the kind of the wetlands of the, 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 the Carony mangroves. And this is where I've been working for, um, for many years. And a few years ago with Tao De Fu at Cornell, uh, we undertook a project um, entitled Landscapes of Extraction. And we looked at the landscape of, of Trinidad um, through, in a way, different lenses. You know, a, a lens that kind of engage with the idea of ecology, that engage with the idea of an environment, the environment that engaged with the idea of creative practice in some way, the, 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 the tools and the vehicles of creative practice, but that um, also looked at the multiple layers and ways in which one might understand uh, specific or contextualized landscapes. And also with a very specific and particular focus on the process of extraction and how extraction uh, certainly in, in colonial societies, is a very significant uh, theme or idea. You know, if one thinks of colonial space or colonial landscapes, they have substantially 
and without exception evolved and derived very much from processes of extraction, whether it's mineral extraction, whether it's vegetable or agricultural extraction, they are all um, places and spaces that, that derived from um, the, the, the expo frequently exploitative processes of extraction. Um, but yet coming out of that and em emerging concurrently with that were multiple layers of human social value. And I'm really interested in this kind of interlacing of how we live, where we live, uh, and how we occupy the landscape and how the landscape is f formed and informed by, by our occupation and, and how that can be and how it is constantly transformed and how uh, it's necessary to be, I think, acutely aware of the, the role of practice, creative practices in whatever form in shaping or transforming um, what can be um, often sort of hyper-realized images of landscapes. You know, the Caribbean often seen as a place of sort of recreation and leisure. Um, the idea of the scenic, the panoramic, kind of the, the idealized view. I think there's this way of understanding landscapes that's to do with rather kind of romantic, idealized visual modes of, of comprehension. But when we look at it more closely and when we start to understand the operation of landscapes, we start to see, particularly as uh, we've identified in our, our project, the extraction project, again, multiple and complex layers. Uh, this is the Gulf of Paria in Trinidad, where we see all the, the ships waiting um, to transport and ship the liquid nat natural gas that is extracted offshore from Trinidad. And you can see there on the coastline the facilities that are evolved and that have developed from that. So I'm very curious about this kind of reading and the multiple readings and layers uh, of how landscapes are used and how they're occupied and the, and the, and the languages that have evolved from that. Uh, in this case, the kind of scientific kind of geological sectional understanding of a landscape, um, quite remote from the sort of scenic, romantic, idealized views of landscapes that, that often consume popular perception or, or appreciation or recognition or appropriation of the landscape. Uh, and then this is, this is uh, some students uh, who are part of the extraction uh, project visiting in um, Point Lisas in Trinidad, some of the facilities that have been put in place to continue this process of extraction. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the the, the, the charts and the statistics for carbon emissions, you know, Trinidad is, I think, second or third in the world per capita as a consequence of this type of uh, engagement and, and operation of extraction. So, you know, a small place um, and a small set of operations, but having really quite phenomenal environmental impacts that largely go kind of unseen uh, because of the expediency of the, uh, the, the, the integration of the operations with the landscape. So the, the project was very much about uncovering the layers and finding new ways of reading the landscape, of understanding it, uh, of appreciating it and uh, recognizing how uh, our hand or our touch on the landscape um, is quite remote from the idea of an aesthetic engagement, that in fact, the sort of substantive impact of the uh, interaction of this type of extraction on the landscape is really very, very complex. Here we can see the Gulf of Paria. This is the, the west coast of Trinidad. And you can see here the tip of Venezuela and the Boca separating Trinidad from Venezuela. And what students have mapped out here are the, the multiple operations that exist within that space um, that go unseen or unnoticed, but constitute a really intense uh, engagement uh, with the land, with the sea, and with this process of uh, intensified extraction. So these readings of uh, the landscape or these readings of the processes of the landscape 
I think have become really quite interesting to me, not as abstract surveying uh, exercises, but as a way of understanding the sheer scale, the sheer, um, the huge phenomenon that this process of extraction and the colonial project um, generated um, and continues to generate in all its sort of current political uh, manifestations and forms. And mapping this and understanding this and then en engaging it, absorbing it at a variety of scales, I think is, is, is critical work um, and critical work in, 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 the, in terms of how one generates practice, how one operates practice, and certainly in terms of how it um, informs our understanding of ideas about infrastructure, about what infrastructure is in fact doing and how it operates. And we see here North America uh, and here uh, Ikeja in Lagos, looking at how similar infrastructures, we, if we were looking at the infrastructures of extraction, perhaps these are infrastructures of mobility, of how we move around space, of how space is informed and constituted by the mobility rather than the mobility informing or constituting um, informed modes of, of determining how inhabitation takes place and how we interpret this again or how we represent it or how we can channel or direct these, in, in, these understandings or these readings or these interpretations, I think can be, or it, it is a critical project. And I think that uh, for a significant part of sort of modern history, let's say modern architectural history, uh, an urban history and landscape history, it's as if the, 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 the project constitutes a kind of service to a larger project. And I think the, the idea of um, taking apart and using the practice of or agency of architecture or landscape architecture to unwrap, uh, to, to, to unravel uh, by looking and by exploring, by charting what is there, gives us some really profound clues about how we might move forward in what is evidently a kind of situation of quite significant crisis. And bringing some of that thinking to Johannesburg, this is a map of an aerial view of Johannesburg, uh, which is a city that 200 years ago didn't exist. You know, it was, uh, you know, developed completely as a mining town, uh, completely again, as a, a place entirely focused uh, on the process of extraction, um, the extraction of gold and uh, mineral products um, for um, capital consumption. The, the whole society evolved, and the, the city evolved from this, uh, this comprehensive process of, of extraction. We can see here some of these uh, maps that chart out all of the licensed gold fields. So this intense energy and this intense focus or representational focus um, purely uh, directed at this process of kind of manic extraction uh, for, for capital gain, I think also speaks to the, uh, the, 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 the determinism, the, the, the kind of obsessive determinism that drives and that has largely driven the occupation of landscapes uh, globally and very specifically uh, in this instance within the context of Gauteng and Johannesburg. We see Johannesburg up here and the whole ridge, the extraction of minerals running for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers uh, and creating a huge amount of uh, energy and uh, development and uh, manipulation and modification of the landscape uh, through a, a whole multi-tiered operation that's completely expedient in terms of its, its motivation. Another one showing the mineral rights in and around Johannesburg. So, as I said, this is, represents a kind of chronicle that, 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 that uh, represents a kind of reading of how we might understand uh, what, is, what is architectural, what is landscape, what is cultural production, what form might it take? This is a view looking uh, looking west over Johannesburg at Soweto, and, and how might one understand these landscapes and uh, how might one engage with these landscapes if in, in, within a project of transformation. Here we have the uh, 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 
ethnic, ethnographic racialized map of South Africa, and the, the uh, bitter history of South Africa and Johannesburg shown here in terms of the racial segregation, providing another dimension or layer of how the, the, the landscape has become subject to highly expedient forces or highly expedient motivations. And an interest here in how we interpret the landscape, how we interpret how it's been uh, modified. These photographs by Leon Kriecher, who's been photographing the uh, dissolution of the mine dumps. Um, so, you know, with all the mining for the gold mining that took place, you know, there was a lot of extraction of soil that created these huge dumps um, that are now currently being sort of dismantled or blasted away. And I think these images uh, are really quite compelling uh, aesthetically, but also speaking to the sheer scale of this type of operation and uh, the uh, recognition of this, this really massive and phenomenal and expedient kind of like marking of the landscape and the, 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 the consequence of this process of extraction. And how, how do we make sense of this uh, in terms of how we move forward, in terms of how we consider transforming the landscape, I think is a really critical, critical project. And it's something that I think that uh, certainly in my work, my photographic work, you know, I try and sort of comprehend and understand a range of landscapes. These are some images I recently took in New York. Um, I spent a lot of time on the river uh, this in, in the, the recent uh, trip that I made and looking at how the intensity of kind of urban development and the way that spaces are, are again expediently occupied and here for recreational use informs our understanding and occupation of the landscape also in meaningful social ways and perhaps almost incidental ways uh, 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 in contrast to the the deterministic and purposeful and intentional formation of the physical city and the climatic condition the condition of the water and then the condition of the surrounding landscape that as one moves away from manhattan there is this completely different reading of the landscape that speaks to a completely different level or type or scale of occupation uh, and i'm really interested in these tensions and i'm really interested in in the way that how we observe the landscape how we observe the context or condition in which we we operate in can inform our ideas or our imaginary or our speculation on how we might occupy the landscape in the future which i think is becoming an, an ever more critical question so these modes of representation modes of operation modes of observation i think become really very important uh, in the process of learning about architecture that uh, or learning about the agencies through which we engage with the, with, with the landscape or with, 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 through which we engage with all forms of inhabitation and this is something that is folded into the work we do at the gsa this work by famida osman for example uses these marbling techniques to look at flows and landforms uh, another way of looking and and a type of a way of working that we not not specifically marbling but the idea of using experimentation and experimentation with representational forms to try to uncover or unwrap or or reveal patterns or behaviors or systems another way of seeing how we might operate or understand the landscape and, and uh, that we occupy. Sipiwe Mlambo, with her project Kwachakeka, Terraforms of Black, looks at colonial landscapes and explores through this performance the relationship to the land and a kind of claim or an appropriation of the landscape. It's again another transformative project um, that's then reflected in some sort of more conventional or harder. Uh, representations of space contrasting with the kind of vitality and vibrancy of the performance so these are also kind of i suppose uh registers of how we read or understand the world that we that, that, that we are that we occupy and the idea that through exploring and through interrogating and investigating modes of representation and creating narratives that perhaps don't um, traditionally or conform in an, don't conform in a traditional or orthodox way with modes of representation can reveal new layers of meaning 
that can be transformative. Marie's Louise Vilhons, Michael Terra working with mycelial landscapes and creating and proposing different notions or ideas of form that contrast quite radically with traditional forms. All, uh, I think, examples of how ways of looking, ways of representing can be transformational, can be transformative in terms of how we, we understand or comprehend the landscape. And again, this project by Magana Patel, the plasticine, looks at the um, horrifying phenomenon of the kind of amount of plastic that's in the sea and plays in an imaginary way um, and starts to investigate uh, and speculate in quite sort of fantastic ways how the phenomenon of this can be transformed or comprehended through the, uh, the project of the new beachfront in Durban. So these are, I suppose, uh, really, they're, they're, they're images I've shown just to show how we take this understanding or reading the complexity of the current situation, not necessarily trying to find pragmatic, pragmatic solutions, but under, understanding how through uh, representation, through imaginative speculation, projection and proposition, that we can push forward, we can advance our imagination, that through the agency of creative practice, one of the things we have the possibility of doing is making, is making propositional work, is anticipating or imagining possible futures, however speculative or however fantastic they might be. And I'm really interested in how one advances um, the project of addressing social inequality, social injustice, environmental inequality through, pra through creative practice and through the imaginary. And that's uh, what I wanted to share with you today. So a little, little chronicle on transformative practices. Thanks so much, uh, Mark. It was really, really interesting. Most of all, thinking in, uh, in, in viewing and seeing the landscape in a different way to approach in a different way, how we are trying to do with Valentina since uh, years along the Arno, but as well us giving our contribute with the Arno Lab and, and with our creative a different way in approaching the reality. I think that now we could like uh, jump to, to Simon, uh, speaking about water. We go to an archipelago in somehow. What is particularly interesting uh, uh, and, and what I ask uh, to Simon to present to us today is the way of uh, uh, them in somehow, because he's, a, he's American. I mean, Hawaii as well is a, is a state of America, but he's, he work really close, more or less. He, close, uh, he work really close with the community over there, with the community that has a great, uh, really big tradition of working with the water, managing in the water and cultivating their own uh, um, uh, agriculture. Yeah, to their own food. So if you would like to share your screen, Simon, thanks so much. We will be, be happy. happy to. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Thank you, Anna Katarina. Thank you, Mark. That was really compelling and, and beautiful. Uh, and, and, and quite apt. I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to follow, uh, particularly the mapping that you, that you show, because the, the real issues in Hawaii are, are ultimately rooted in the land divisions, and we are experiencing a lot of the same issues. So I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share uh, this uh, small perspective today. I'll very quickly orient this uh, problem around a, a series of slides that go into the uh, some of the questions in the Hawaiian landscape, and then I'll uh, shift into uh, a short introduction of this uh, film project that we were invited to participate in for the uh, Biennale and, and, and it sort of uh, become kind of chapter one in a kind of compendium of work that we're hoping to uh, continue to produce. So let me share my screen with you all. And we should have this up for everyone. Can we see? Okay, yes, fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. Well, the, the name of the short film is Ho'omana Vanui, which roughly translates to a, a whole number of different things. It's a long word and it, and it has a, a number of components to it. But ultimately in this question of resilience, the notion of patience and duration 
this notion of being long suffering and making time longer, uh, but also to believe in the things that we know to preserve life become really critical. There is a kind of presumption about what Hawaii is, and it's obviously typically re uh, associated with tourism. Uh, it's also he heavily militaristic, uh, but the romantic view of Hawaii is more common. It's often seen as a souvenir or a postcard. It's reduced really to a, a, the, the, the pictorial and the scenic. As, as Mark's uh, presentation suggested, it's not so dissimilar. And uh, what we often encounter are these enclaves of extraction. Um, what I would like to present today is a, a different perspective on how the land has been managed over generations and how that knowledge, that, that um, authentic indigenous knowledge uh, has, uh, has legs again and is being essentially perpetuated into the future. Uh, I'll, invite you all to investigate this particular project. This is a site called Kaka'o Iwi uh, on the windward side of Oahu. And it's a completely closed loop, uh, highly resilient landscape. Uh, and again, we sort of define resilience as the ability to rebound after disturbance or after uh, you know, uh, catastrophe. Um, this site has been, it's very storied. There's a, a long lineage of, um, exploitative uses of the land here. Um, but this nonprofit currently resides here and as stewards of the landscape um, are using this site for cultural educational practices, really reconnecting um, and bridging uh, generations. Uh, keiki or children and kupuna or elders and ancestors working together, sharing stories or mo'olelo and really perpetuating that narrative. Um, our archipelago is uh, quite dynamic. There are myriad systems coexisting simultaneously. And as you can imagine, it's also this incredible cultural amalgam of everything in the world, the kind of cross Pacific um, you know, diaspora, as well as technically being an American state, the 50th state, the last uh, to enter the union. Um, and, and, and all of that comes with a, a range of really incredible uh, offerings, the, the, the kind of, um, you know, uh, exchanges that are potentially, uh, you know, available to people and as well the, uh, the, the, the kind of problematic nature of, co you know, colonialism and, and then decolonization. Um, the island, I would just love to give you some vocabulary to help us orient around. Um, the, the island is broken up into a series of divisions in, uh, in, in Hawaiian uh, cultural practice and in, in, in sort of the historic sense. Uh, the sort of Western colonization of Hawaii tended to be somewhat arbitrary. Um, but if we look back to uh, this indigenous knowledge, the land was divided up in the most common sense way possible. If we look into a particular uh, sort of transect of that island, you see a watershed. And these are called ahupua'a. Each ahupua'a is essentially a watershed. And each was a self-contained community, uh, uh, essentially a composite of zones that shared and exchanged with one another. If we zoom in onto this today, we see a real you know, interesting kind of dilemma where uh, these sort of systems of um, colonization have essentially become like ecological systems. We notice the roads and the, um, the highways and the infrastructure actually acting as stream corridors. So this like return to the Ahupua'a is actually really, really challenging. Uh, the urban condition is highly impervious. It is uh, essentially a sheet flow of water, but basically all of our streets turn into rivers when it rains and it's uh, raining all the time. Um, and this conveyance of all of the stuff that, that lands, um, all of the sort of stuff of daily life, it really lands right back in our laps. Uh, we have enormous, uh, you know, risk uh, flooding, sea level rise, all, all these sort of eventual kinds of um, things have, have landed right on our lap and they're not like the future. It's really a matter of uh, 
you know, mitigating risks today, but also finding some kind of like meaning in the risk and, and maybe challenging the notion that that water is a is is flooding. Maybe water is wealth. Maybe water is actually restorative and ameliorative. Uh, we also, as Mark indicated, have very similar issues with income and wealth disparity. The uh, the the kind of image that we have in our mind of Hawaii is 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 lush and and uh, very prosperous, but that's absolutely not the case. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a broad spectrum um, of inequality. We also see this convergence of the the urban the urban system with the supporting sort of hinterland uh, of agriculture and this kind of uh, you know broad attempt to conserve what is left. Uh, we have almost a million people on the island of Oahu. It's the third largest in the archipelago. Everybody basically lives, uh, there's a couple hundred thousand other um, residents of Hawaii on the other islands, but it's a very dense, uh, highly populated area. Uh, and many of the uh, institutions that exist are, are conscious of the issues and are uh, sort of establishing kind of monitoring systems and communication systems uh, between each other to essentially uh, kind of reframe this, this problem. If we look at the, the kauhale, or well, hale means house, and the kauhale is sort of all of the productive space, all of the things that we, we kind of um, consume in our daily life. And the kipuka, or the, the puka is a whole. So these, there's also these like pockets of spaces that have been uh, essentially kind of, kind of saved, if, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, but there really is no nirvana. We're sort of saying, we're sort of gardening all the time, saying what lives and what dies and, 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 and making this kind of selective process. Uh, and some of the work that's being done now to explore what, uh, what options we have for moving forward come from these you know, short-term kind of gains in retrofitting, uh, taking what has been sort of channelized and restoring some of those riparian corridors um, also in, in expanding some of the existing kind of park infrastructure as essentially a sort of a network of, of sponges uh, that can help uh, absorb uh, rainfall. And so we see this kind of convergence of this, uh, uh, you know, amalgam of culture, as well as the um, really, really heavily resource intensive extraction of uh, you know, uh, those, those, those sort of vestiges of what made the place special in the first place. Um, and so this presents us with a really interesting kind of moment. Now, I, I would also like to just make a quick kind of plug for the program that I'm a part of. Uh, we are growing a brand new landscape architecture program at the University of Hawaii, and our curriculum really closely follows sort of what's uh, at hand in the archipelago. In on the right-hand side on the bottom is the big island of Hawaii which is extremely dynamic, it's volcanic, it's active, and we can actually sort of study how land uh, fundamentally is created at, at first and sort of in its origins. The archipelago gets, archipelago gets older the farther to the west you go. Uh, and again, we see in, in Oahu this kind of incredible convergence of basically everything in the world um, in a very hyper sort of intense concentration. And then out toward Kauai, Ni'ihau, and the rest of the island chain that's being conserved, we see incredible uh, conservation efforts and stewardship efforts. So we, we see this curriculum as, a, as kind of a, the totality of, uh, of, of the sort of Hawaiian experience. I would like to, to just also kind of share some of my team's perspectives. When uh, Anna Katarina invited uh, uh, me to participate in um, this sort of short film festival, uh, I immediately thought, wow, I need to build a great team. And so uh, I was very fortunate to get some, some incredible help and I'll, I'll introduce them to you shortly. We also wanted to just frame this notion around our own capacity. What, what, what could we do here and what, what can we not do? Uh, and we chose to look for authenticity and look for the real stories of life and family and, and the sort of materiality and atmosphere and, and texture of the land and, and instead not concentrate our scope as much on some of these other really, really, really tricky issues. This kind of uh, messy sketch was our first conversation around how we would frame the issue. Um, 
the question of what makes this landscape particularly resilient, what makes this community particularly resilient is its culture. And so we wanted to have a kind of split screen in the sort of beginning of the film that would um, sort of showcase some of those contradictions um, uh, and, and, and essentially tie the people that are here to the land and, and, um, and to each other. The center of the, or the middle of the, the film was really about, um, uh, you know, sort of engaging with uh, those forms and the kind of visualization of, of hands in the low E or hands in the mud or our passive irrigation um, kind of uh, terraced landscapes, uh, agricultural landscapes. The end was really aimed at this story between Kupuna or elders and ancestors and Keiki, the children. Uh, these mood boards kind of give a sense of the character of some of the agricultural spaces. Uh, we were essentially shopping for a, a, you know, a set to shoot the film. Uh, and we were aiming for a kind of a richness of texture and atmosphere and a legibility of this notion of um, not just consumption in the short term, but um, this like real righteousness and the perpetuation of that righteousness uh, and the kind of the rooted uh, and grounded uh, experience of landscape and how, uh, how you know, uh, uh, food and activation of these agricultural spaces um, is really the, the, the sort of like true remaining um, kind of authentic experience. Uh, just very briefly, this is our, our film team. I just wanted to introduce you. Um, this is Ara, the director, and, and Indy, our production assistant. Um, and just to give you a sense of sort of the cast of characters involved here, Kamuela uh, is a cultural practitioner and, and farmer at Kakao Uivi, and it's just an amazing, amazing guy. Lala Nas, uh, our dear friend, Anna Katerina's friend and mine, um, who is our community outreach person. You'll also hear her voice as the narrator of the film. Keola Raposo is another cultural practitioner and an executive director of Kakao Uivi. He's also a graphic designer and a creative director. Uh, and he's responsible for the kind of graphic language that um, goes into the, to the project. Uh, these are his um, diagrams and his, his uh, typography, which was invented for the film. Actually, uh, the name of the font is Ohaha, which is a beautiful word, which means plump and ripe. So you see these kind of chubby letters, which is really wonderful. And also the texture of water and the texture of land um, as a kind of a graphic overlay uh, was something that we wanted to pursue in, uh, in this production. And so with that, I'd like to just kind of show a little bit of the film, if I could. And uh, my slides are available if anybody's interested in seeing the full thing. But I'll show just a one minute introduction of the film. And then there's a couple minutes of my team's um, uh, kind of perspective on this. Um, are we ending in three minutes, Anna Katarina? Yes, yes, perfect, thanks. Okay, all right, let's do this one here. Hawaii, Hawaii. What is it that makes this landscape so resilient? It is the people who truly know this place, who make it what it is. Bruh, and then you bring in a whole halal full of hula dancers. Boy, and they just keep going six hours later. Like, oh, because you have a hula in front of me, uh, for the love for life. But this part right here, you see how it all comes out? This right here is a whole leaf. Mm. See that? So this is the magic haumea all inside here. If you want to know what makes Hawaiians live forever, it's in that half an inch. The patterns call out to us to be understood, the wisdom inherent in the materials and flows, and therefore taught and learned and followed. Aloha, my name is I'm going to skip mine here. Eric, Aloha, my kako. My name is Lorian Baird, Hokuli'i Haufrich Nas, aka Lala Nas. Born, raised, and educated in Honouli Uli Oahu, along the shores of the Ever Plains, and in Waikeuka Hilo, 
on the island of Moko Kiave. Hello, my name is Vicky Big Aralela Fidusha, and I am a Hawaii based creative director and strategist. I teach in the art and design department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa and serve as a board member for Hawaii Contemporary. Aloha mai kako, o ke ola naka ahi ki raposo ko inoa, no ka mo ili ili mai au, whara po ailana, no ka mo ili ili mai au. I'm a creative director, she's my daughter, uh, and some of my responsibilities include a seat on the board at Kako EV. Uh, we are a community-based nonprofit organization whose mission is to strengthen the communities through the perpetuation of the culture and spiritual practices of the native Hawaiian people. And so I'll stop there and thank you okay. all. Okay, thanks so much, uh, uh, Simon. It was great to see all the structure finally with someone like you that showed to us uh, something, uh, something a little bit more about Hawaii that for us is uh, quite a far landscape, you know, a landscape of, of the dreams somehow, but uh, to link uh, this structure of your landscape uh, to the system of the water uh, and, and then the flooding problem was really important for us uh, because it's really what is related this to our river, pro river, uh, river project that is hosting us uh, that uh, was created to um, uh, reinvigorate uh, the memory of the river that in yeah. somehow is abandoned for the fear of the last flooding of 1966, uh, no, in somehow. So this idea, of uh, uh, see in a different way and, 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 and have more explanation by an expert like you in similar landscape, I mean, really different, but in somehow with the same problem was really interesting for us. And uh, now I would like, uh, because we have a little bit of time, I would like uh, to share my screen because uh, we could uh, uh, have in somehow, we tried before, to share the presentation of Jason. Jason sent to us a presentation that is, is, is quite uh, um, you know, important because it's an, another completely different approach uh, uh, to the problem of the re, uh, redesigning our contemporary uh, um, uh, landscape, most of all in China, that is, you know, is really particular, um, I mean, um, context. And so you will see what he's going to present to us. Uh, please let me know if we can hear the audio. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Ho. I'm an architect and a curator based in China. And firstly, um, thanks Anna Katerina for inviting me this, uh, to these dialogues and giving me this opportunity to talk about my work. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Framing Informality. In this talk, I will share with you uh, some of my projects and um, interventions that are engaged with informal public space and a space that uh, I have been uh, particularly looking at uh, in China over the past 10 years. Uh, okay, I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint. All right. Okay, as, um, as you know, there are a large amount of former public spaces in Chinese cities. They are enormous, super neat, and were designed by landscape architects. But they are barely used and left empty most of the time. And public space in China is becoming increasingly controlled and regulated. And many of them are furnished with a set of fixed programs. Um, public space is becoming more and more formalized instead of being opportunistic. On the other hand, informal space is um, everyday space. It's more appropriated by the ordinary people and less intervened by authorities and landscape architects. 
And however, when one talks about informa, it's often associated with the tense of spontaneity, um, improvisation, and chaos. So today I'm not going to talk about something very big and formal, but something very small and very informal, something that is closely associated with the everyday lives of ordinary people. But first, I would like to share with you some of my um, personal stories. In 1992, my parents bought a house in a gated community in, in China's uh, Fujian province after their retirement. In front of our house, there was a raised rose garden bed. In the first week after we moved in, my mom gave me a weird task. And she asked me uh, to remove one rose tree every day from the garden. Two weeks later, 15 rose trees were removed without notice. As a result, a small empty plot was formed in a rose garden. And this empty plot later became my mother's secret uh, vegetable plot. And very soon, the neighbors found out and followed our footprint. Two months later, the rose garden designed uh, by landscape architects was completely transformed into an informal vegetable garden by the neighbors. What happened next was um, incredible. While working in this vegetable garden and the neighbors who never spoke a word to each other before uh, began to interact and initiate conversation conversations. The transformation of a rose garden to a vegetable garden also inspired the rest of the residents <coughs> in this community, excuse me, <coughs> to turn other garden beds um, into the vegetable plots. In 2017, the local government um, launched an urban renewal project mainly um, targeting their old communities and urban villages. Sadly, all the vegetable plots in our um, community were removed on the excuse of their informality. Uh, the one in which my mother grew vegetables was also reprogrammed into an old fitness court. However, the fitness court has been left unused all the time since its completion. And today, the fitness court and its surroundings have been occupied by the locals and become a parking space for both vehicles and shared bikes. My mother's story always makes me wonder what makes former space informal. Can we design or plan informality? In order to answer these questions, I further carry out an observation exercise in a Guangzhou's community park a few years ago. The park is located in an old community of Guangzhou. It's filled with trees and a few landscaping rocks. And due to the lack of basic infrastructure such as seeds, and the park was quite empty and inactive and without seeds. Uh, observed that the locals appropriate the rocks as their makeshift seeds. And this act of appropriation inspired me and to conduct a spatial experiment in this park. In 2019, I brought a group of landscape architecture students into this community and asked them to observe the informal practice of the locals in the public spaces and to reveal what type of specific materials or spatial conditions the locals would use to help their informal practice. In the end of this exercise, every student must find a local material that is directly associated with an act of informal occupation in this community and then bring it into this park. Together, all these local materials, such as commercial leaflets, bricks, concrete rocks, um, planks, egg trays, and 
uh, plastic stools brought by the students were piled up and left it under a tree canopy. What I did next is I started documenting how the locals would use these materials to promote informal uses of this park according to their de demands. After seeing these materials, uh, the homeless, the street workers and the locals came immediately and started unpacking, moving and rearranging them according to their needs. Um, some became seats and others um, were turned into uh, tables. They used these materials um, to create different spatial uh, combinations in different locations of this park for uh, different purposes, such as gathering and sleeping, dining, watching movies, or um, playing cards. During this period of time, some materials were um, disappeared, um, but new ones were brought in by the locals to form more spatial combinations. What fascinating about ordinary people is everyone can take advantage of these uh, materials found in this park and create their own spaces according to their desires and even physical conditions. For example, they used a range of very specific materials from a PVC foam board to, a, to an egg tray to adjust the height uh, of seeds in their own creative ways. This type of informal occupation of space can never be captured in a bird's eye view or through a top-down model. Uh, however, landscape architects don't anticipate on designing for these people, but by knowing how they use a space, landscape architects can certainly plan conditions or provide micro infrastructures to facilitate informal uses of a space. And landscape architects will have two planned spaces for such informal and volatile activities that cannot always be well prescribed uh, and predicted. It's better to plan for what is inevit inevitable than to turn a totally blind eye uh, to the future, as uh, Tiwari suggests. So from this exercise, I began to um, understand that informal practice is not at all a chaotic phenomenon, it can become highly specific um, once you closely observe the people who use it and the activities that take place there. In other words, informal practice and responds to very particular circumstances. It only takes place in a specific place and requires very specific conditions or micro infrastructures. Uh, it's governed by opportunities instead of rules and regulations. In 2015, after the completion of my PhD study in Australia, I started working in China as a backpacker teacher. Uh, stayed in a place right next to the Pearl River in Guangzhou's Panyi district. This riverside walkway was my everyday running track for around four years. This area is mainly occupied by elders, uh, sorry, and regardless of a large aging population living here, this five kilometer long riverfront walkway was seriously lack of basic infrastructures like seatings. Uh, it was very empty most of the time. There were only few elders coming here with um, their own plastic stools. And this immediately got me to think, um, how could I attract more elders to come and use this workway by providing micro infrastructures? 
So I began with looking at what is already there, something small, portable, light, and free to take. In the end, I targeted the trash cans uh, placed on the walkway. As not many people coming here, some of the trash cans remained empty. Surprisingly, I further found out that the lid can, the lid, uh, can be removed from the trash can by twisting it around. And this was the moment I asked myself a very weird question. What if I removed all the lids from the trash cans and placed them along the walkway? What would it happen? On 18 October 2015, it was Sunday, I got up around 4 o'clock in the morning and started my illegal mission. In 5 hours, I took 253 lids off the trash cans along the walkway. However, I need to make a kind of reminder here to the audience, please do not follow what you are seeing. Now, in this slice, it's illegal to do so. Trust me, uh, I did only for the sake of my research. Then I placed the lids uh, randomly on the walkway. In addition, I cleaned up the surface of every lid and stick a free to use note on the top. I had no idea how long these lids would remain there before the local urban management officers found out and take back. One week later, I came back to the walkway and to see what happened there. And I never realized that this was one of the most exciting moments in my life. Along the walkway, I saw many groups of people, men in the elders from the nearby communities gathering together and playing cards. In very creative ways, the elders began to appropriate the trash can lids uh, for different informal uses. Some of them were seeds, while others became tables. I also observed that there was uh, more rubbish in the trash cans uh, than ever before. Without these lids, it's easier for the public to uh, throw the rubbish. Very sadly, five weeks later, the lids were all removed from the walkway by the local urban management officers. And the trash cans were replaced by new ones whose lids cannot be taken off anymore. In the meantime, a message was delivered to the elders Whoever uses the public trash cans again will receive a heavy fine. Just like the saying goes, one door closed, another one opens. What I didn't expect was that the elders didn't give up and leave their workway. On the contrary, in order to maintain their established neighborhood relations and social activities, they continued to occupy the walkway by bringing their own used furniture from home as the replacements of the trash can lids. From a big sofa to different types of chairs um, and tables. Suddenly, the walkway became an auto museum of used furniture. With this furniture at hand, uh, the elders started extending their occupations further along the walkway. In order to make a contribution, I also donated a broken cabinet for the elders to use on the walkway. However, not long after the elders attempt to do another thing, they started redesigning the walkway. The level of their intervention ranged from light to very, very heavy. For example, in order to make their seats more comfortable, the elders rolled the concrete benches while sitting on chairs. 
This act is definitely a huge insult for landscape architects who design this place. Oh, in order to lower the stone tables, the elders took off their fixed stone legs. And then readjusted the height of the tables by using different combinations、um, of materials. And then the elders used the dismantled stone legs as makeshift seats and tables. One day, the locals brought a huge sofa set on the walkway, which immediately became a popular spot. Uh, not just、uh, for the elders, but also for the homeless. In combination with the sofa, the cabinet I、uh, contributed was finally used by the elders for playing chess, just like the metal bars. One of the surface of the cabinet became a supportive structure for placing the chessboard. No matter what the elders can. Always find a unique and creative way to promote informal uses of the workway by taking advantage of the furniture given on the spot. From 2017, the numbers of people coming to use the workway suddenly went up. Therefore, a few leaders of the elders stepped up and decided to help maintain the public order of the workway. They formed a grassroots association called the Home of the Elderly. And firstly, the Home of the Elderly Association established a repair team to take res responsibility for all the broken furniture on the walkway. Secondly, the association also set up a petrol team to stop smoking and littering on the walkway. They even made no smoking and no lit littering notice along the walkway under an assumed name of the local law enforcement department. On March two thousand eighteen, I went to a talk show and shared this project with the public, which triggered a public debate. The video of my talk received over five million views on internet just in two days. However, using the trash can lids and furniture as the tools of carrying out informal practice on the workway aroused media interest, receiving different critical comments. An article raised such a question: Why don't the local authorities stop the public from using their own furniture by providing more decent seats on the workway? And they did. However, this time the local authorities didn't remove the elders' furniture and creations on the walkway, just like how they did to the trash can lids last time. Instead, they accomplished two things. Firstly, as the media suggested, they quickly installed hundreds of water-facing seats along the walkway. But it was turned out to be a failure. The seats left unoccupied most of the time. This type of spatial arrangement is hard to trigger face-to-face -face conversations or interactions. No one likes sitting there and staring at water all the time. In fact, the elders like facing the streets and observing things and watching people come and go、um, on the streets. However, that what is good about the trash can lids, all the furniture is people can move them and rearrange them at will, and use them as tools to curate space according to their desires. And this empowered, this empowered them to be in charge of this place. They are the owners and designers. Without having any sense of ownership. On these fixed seats provided by the local authorities, the visitors started leaving their rubbish there after they used these seats. 
waiting for the sanitation workers to clean up. However, one good thing about this water-facing seed is the locals like to use them as supportive structures for hanging out their beddings in a sunny day. The second thing the government did after my public speech was to provide a number of wheelchair ramps along the walkway for the elders who cannot walk. Apart from those furniture brought by the elders, this is another type of significant micro-infrastructure provided by the local authorities to further promote the informal uses of this walkway. In the middle of 2018, with the help of the Home of the Elderly Association, an informal barber shop was set up on the walkway, serving the elders who gathered there. Today, this walkway has become a place where different social groups, from the sanitation workers and the delivery guys to the homeless people, can gather together and interact with each other. The Workaway project suggests a different way in which landscape architects in China could act when dealing with public spaces, whether through direct intervention with the site or by provide provision of micro-infrastructures that could enable informal uses to take place. This project is an example in terms of how designers can transform situations with small changes. Designers like landscape architects can do so much more than just draw up a top-down master plan. On the other hand, this workway project challenges not merely the ways of informal space being understood and imagined by authorities and designers, but also challenges the production of informal space. So I fear that there is an urge um, to explore new ways that landscape architects can work with informality and to expand the roles of landscape architects. Study, studies in informality do not defy the conventional design analysis, but instead offering alternative ways of seeing, thinking, and acting. However, in all the above-mentioned projects, um, I'm not interested um, in the images of informa, but rather what is behind it, uh, what causes it, and how can we use it as uh, landscape architects. More importantly, um, this workway project allows me to understand how an informal quality of a space uh, can be promoted without massive uh, destruction and become a significant design element for the future um, public domain in Chinese cities. And this is particularly relevant in contemporary Chinese urbanism as former and informal spaces continuously uh, coexist and operate uh, together. Growing up in a country like China, um, I saw massive construction and destruction of cities every day. And this never-ending large-scale construction and destruction of cities um, have kept reminding me as a landscape architect um, before we start transferring our conceptual drawings onto a real life context and making new rules and conditions, we must understand how ordinary people use and read spaces in their everyday lives. Um, do not forget that sometimes landscape architects can change situations with very small design gestures. Um, just like how the trash can lids have uh, completely transformed the walkway and enriched the everyday lives of 
those elderly people. In conclusion, being chaotic is not a problem. Um, there are opportunities for people to appropriate space. There is always formality within informality, order within chaos. Um, as landscape architects, we need to reveal the invisible code and order behind the informal or chaotic phenomenon and deeply understand what really makes this works. Okay, that's it. I um, hope this will help you. And thank you. I um, really wish to see you, see everyone very, very soon. Bye bye. Okay, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm really happy that at the end we had the opportunity to hear uh, the presentation of Jason that I think it was really interesting and help us in understand how we could uh, really create community with different way of practicing our, our practice, our role like uh, as an uh, architect, landscape architect, curator, Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, that is, is somehow what we tried to do uh, during the last uh, the past edition of Arno Labs along uh, the the Arno River under River project. So for now, I think that uh, I'm still speaking in English for Mark. Uh, Simon just left us because he has to run to another presentation. So I want to do thanks, I, I believe, uh, thanks so much to our contributors. I think that was quite rich, uh, our presentation. We are really in delay, but I think that it would be really important to show as well uh, the, 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 the contribute of, of Jason, uh, most of all for his attitude uh, uh, in, in, in his country that as, as we know is a really particular one. And uh, now I can switch in Italian, allora grazie mille. Eh, ehm, grazie a tutti i nostri interlocutori, i nostri contributors eh, all'interno di questi dialogues, questi dialoghi. Eh, abbiamo finalmente potuto sentire la presentazione di Jason Ho, che io credo mh, sia molto interessante, sia stata molto interessante, molto chiara e per noi particolarmente preziosa, perché come noi sappiamo da qualche anno a questa parte noi della Cina Abbiamo poche notizie, soprattutto per il discorso del pandemico. Lui ci ha fatto vedere appunto questo progetto che è partito eh, qualche anno addietro, ma che appunto eh, quello che a me è rimasto molto impresso è stato, eh, a parte certe parole che lui ha utilizzato come anarchia, rompere le regole no? in un paese come la Cina, ma anche quella immagine strepitosa dei vecchietti che appunto Uh, durante il, il pandemico nel 2021 erano fuori sedute su queste eh, vecchie, vecchi mobili, eh, diciamo questi punti di appoggio dai quali poter eh, godersi di questo fiume in realtà mh, sovrastrutturato, super rigido e appunto um, diciamo um, puntualmente um, uh, arricchito da queste sedute che in realtà eh, dice, diciamo molto formali, molto classiche, ma che in realtà eh, era difficile per loro apprezzare completamente. Quindi questa colonizzazione dello spazio pubblico, no? di cui noi parliamo sempre con Valentina, che è molto importante per noi, che appunto racconta la nostra pratica professionale da anni e quello che ci, insomma, ci vede legati da anni in questa collaborazione, io penso che sia interessante e uno spunto importante da avere. Tra l'altro noi eh, insomma, eh, queste, questi video sono registrati, quindi sono sulla pagina Facebook del MAD, Murate Art District. E, um, penso che metteremo a questo punto, visto che non si è sentito l'audio, possiamo mettere anche il Marketing Museum, che è importante, lo metteremo, penso, nel canale eh, YouTube eh, del MAD. Poi Valentina e Tommaso mi, 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 mi confermeranno. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm sorry if I speak in Italian. I'm trying to, you know, close the evening. That was so rich. I can uh, follow it. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> Mark, thank you for your contribution. It was very interesting. So thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me.
E quindi grazie mille, adesso veramente chiudiamo perché siamo molto in ritardo, però ecco io ci tenevo molto a dire questo che sono molto contenta di aver avuto l'opportunità di condividere questa knowledge, come dicono gli inglesi, scusate la pronuncia, questa conoscenza così alle più diverse latitudini e longitudini, questa triangolazione diciamo, no? perché è una vera e propria triangolazione tra le Hawaii, il Sudafrica e la Cina all'interno insomma del MAD che possiamo dire un po' il cuore pulsante della produzione dell'arte contemporanea nella città, in una città, eh, la città d'arte per antonomasia come Firenze. Grazie Anna mille. Caterina, ti ringrazio, vorrei fare un ringraziamento anche ad Anci, la Presidenza del Consiglio dei Ministri che supporta certo, questi certo, nostri incontri. Certo, certo, grazie mille, grazie al progetto Riva, Lumen e all'Anci che, che ci supporta. Grazie ragazzi, ci vediamo il prossimo appuntamento è fissato per il 30 di marzo. Avremo Emanuele Montibeller di Artesella e Alessandro Melis uh, che si connetterà da New York. Uh, grazie mille, thanks so much to all. Uh, see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Grazie Valentina. Ciao ragazzi, ciao, ciao Tommaso, ciao Mark. <ride> ciao, buona serata.